aside. And we remind ourselves that no matter where we are, we are able to find that peace, that stillness, that quiet of prayer. In the midst of the storm, our brother and way shower, Jesus, said, peace, be still. And so in this moment, we breathe. If you've not already done so, I invite you to lay aside anything you may have in your hands. Make sure you're sitting comfortably. Close your eyes if you're comfortable doing so. Just take a few deep breaths. Many times when we begin our meditation, it is helpful to focus on the breath. It is the essence of now. This breath in and this breath out. There is no past, no future. It's this moment, this breath, this connection to the universe and all that is. We are reminded as we focus on the breath to let go of that which was and not to focus on that which is not yet but to be here now. For truly, all the joy our heart has ever longed for, all the love, all the connection, all the abundance, all of it is right here, right now. We can be in complete peace and we can be in complete joy and we can at long last unlock the gate to the kingdom of heaven if we live now for this day, this moment. this breath. There is no future happiness. There is no past regret. There is only now. And our choice as to how we spend it. Do we spend it in fear? Do we spend it in worry? Do we spend it in recrimination? Do we spend it in regret? Or do we take a breath? And remember, right here, right now, I am a child of the Most High. Right here, right now, I am a light of this world. Right here, right now, I belong. I am loved. My life has purpose. And the universe supports me unconditionally. Right here, right now. So I invite you to take this knowing, this knowing that right here, right now, 
we have everything we need. And in the joy of that knowing, which is truly the key that unlocks the kingdom of heaven, we spend a moment in the silence. when we live in the now, how easy it becomes to know how blessed we really are, how easy it is to slip into joy and appreciation for this life, this breath, this heartbeat. this family that lovingly supports us on our path, this day. All the blessings that we have. How much better it is to live in the now the new Jerusalem, that kingdom of heaven on earth that is always waiting for us when we pray right here, right now. Thank you. Thank you, sweet spirit, for this reminder for this glorious life, for this breath, and for this now moment. <sighs> so it is. Come on in. You're in the right place. So good morning, Unity of Birmingham. I am Reverend Charles Perry. I'm the senior minister here, and it is wonderful to see you all here on a Sunday morning, especially such a beautiful morning. So welcome. And if this is your first time with us or your first time back in a long time, know that we are glad you are here. So this morning, I'm going to be doing something that I, I really haven't done before. I haven't talked about this before. Um, I realize that it would probably be uncommon for you to walk into a Methodist church and hear a talk about the Wesleys. Right? I'm not sure if the, the Mormon church, you know, talks about uh, their founder or if any of the other common uh, religions that we have around talk about the people who started their denominations. In unity, um, 
because of the way that we may be perceived by some of the folks around us, I think it's helpful to know where this denomination came from and to understand the lives of the couple who were largely responsible for us being here today. So since I'm talking about things that are basic to unity, so I'm going back to basics this year, I wanted to at least spend one Sunday letting you know about the people that founded this thing that we call unity. So if you were not already aware of it, Unity was founded in 1889 by a couple called Myrtle and Charles Fillmore. And uh, their stories are pretty fascinating. Um, Myrtle was born in 1845 in uh, Ohio, and she grew up in a Methodist household. And like many people of that era, she contracted tuberculosis. And it kind of bothered her off and on throughout her life and became really symptomatic and uh, was supposed to be fatal when she was in her early 40s. Now, by the time she was that age, by the time she was 42 years old, she had met and married Charles Fillmore. Charles had been born about nine years after Myrtle. Um, in, I believe it was St. Cloud in Minnesota, and he was actually born right outside of a Native American Indian reservation. He uh, was also beset with health problems most of his life. When he was 10 years old, he had a skating accident, and his hip was badly damaged and became somewhat necrotic. And the result of it was that as he grew, as a boy, his, the hip that was damaged, that leg did not grow. And by the time he became an adult, his, uh, he was walking around on a, like a block of wood that was about four inches plus the shoe that he had. Um, he didn't have a lot of feeling in that leg. And I'll, I'll relate in his words some of his experience with that. But they were both people that had experienced um, very personal pain for a very long time in their life. Now, what we have to do is just like when we look at anything, um, particularly when we look at the Bible, it's good to look at things in context. So when we talk about mental healing, when we talk about Christian science, it is useful to remember that the medical capabilities back in those days were not nearly as advanced as they are today. Um, there were many places where people were still being bled or having leeches applied. Um, antiseptics were not commonly used yet. Um, it was just as likely for medical treatment to harm someone as it was to help them. And there was no treatment for tuberculosis at that time, um, no effective treatment. People got it and they died. So they were desperate, a strong word. But in the words of their oldest son, Lowell, he was speaking of uh, his mother in particular. He said, we didn't realize growing up how bad it had gotten for her. Um, right before she found New Thought, uh, she had been given about six months to live, and the family was trying to decide, well, you know, what can we do to make this easy for her? And they had considered taking her up to the mountains because where they were living in Kansas City, uh, the weather was not, it just, just wasn't good for her. But about that time, she went to a lecture by a fellow from Chicago who had graduated from some classes offered by Emma Curtis Hopkins. Emma Curtis Hopkins had been a student of Mary Baker Eddy, who was the founder of Christian Science. She and Mary had kind of had a split. Mary um, had some control issues. And so Emma Curtis Hopkins went on to establish her own New Thought seminary, and many of the people that we think of as pioneers of New Thought, including the Fillmores, eventually were ordained by Emma Curtis Hopkins. But in this particular case, it was one of her graduates named E.B. Weeks. 
And he was giving a talk, and Myrtle felt compelled to go and see what he had to say and to see if there was anything that could help her. And the net effect of what he said to her, she understood as being, I am a child of God, and as such, I do not inherit sickness. And it was a very profound realization for her. And what she did in the following weeks and months and even years was to work with her body and to essentially tell it that it was well. And I'm going to speak in her words because she has some really beautiful language. And I want you to hear her voice. It flashed upon me that I might talk to the life in every part of my body and have it do just what I wanted. I began to teach my body and got marvelous results. I told the life in my liver that it was not torpid or inert, but full of vigor and energy. I told the life in my stomach that it was not weak or inefficient, but energetic, strong, and intelligent. I told the life in my abdomen that it was no longer infested with ignorant ideas of disease put there by myself and my doctors, but it was all a thrill with the sweet, pure, wholesome energy of God. I told my limbs that they were active and strong. I told my eyes that they did not see of themselves, but that they expressed the sight of spirit and that they were drawing on an unlimited source. I told them that they were young eyes, clear, bright eyes, because the light of God shone right through them. I told my heart that the pure love of Jesus Christ flowed in and out through its beatings and that all the world felt its joyous pulsation. I went to all the life centers in my body and spoke words of truth to them, words of strength and power. I asked their forgiveness for the foolish ignorant course that I had pursued in the past when I condemned them and called them weak, inefficient, and diseased. Now, this is important. I did not become discouraged at their being slow to wake up, but kept right on, both silently and aloud, declaring the words of truth until the organs responded. That's powerful stuff. Myrtle began healing herself in 1886. And it took about two years for her to clear her body of tuberculosis. But in that two-year time period, she went from six months to live to healed. Which was an amazing thing in those days. Being healed from tuberculosis was something that did not happen to people. Now, this obviously got the attention of her husband, particularly with the issues that he had had. And even though they were doing quite well in, uh, he was doing very well in the real estate business in Kansas City at the time, he was also uh, an investor in silver mines in Colorado. They decided to explore this new thought thing and to immerse themselves in it. Now, Charles's story and how this worked for him um, took a lot longer. And I'm going to read something that he wrote um, much later on in life. But he says, but I can testify to my own healing of tuberculosis of the hip Remember, they didn't have a whole lot of diagnostic stuff out there, and a lot of times they just thought, well, something's wrong with me on the inside. It must be tuberculosis. (laughs) When a boy of 10, I was taken with what was at first diagnosed as rheumatism, but developed into a very serious case of hip disease. I was in bed over a year, and from that time, an invalid in constant pain for 25 years, or until I began the application of the divine law. Two very large tubercular abscesses developed at the head of the hip bone, which the doctors said would finally drain away my life. 
but I managed to get about on crutches with a four inch cork and steel extension on the right leg. The hip bone was out of the socket and stiff. The leg shriveled and ceased to grow. The whole right side became involved. My right ear was deaf and my right eye weak. From hip to knee, the flesh was a glassy adhesion with but little sensation. When I began applying the spiritual treatment, there was for a long time slight response in the leg, but I felt better. And I found that I began to hear with the right ear. Then gradually I noticed that I had more feeling in the leg. Then as the years went by, the ossified joint began to get limber and the shrunken flesh filled out until the right leg was almost the equal to the other. Then I discarded the cork and steel extension and wore an ordinary shoe with a double heel about an inch in height. Now, the leg is almost as large as the other. The muscles are restored, and although the hip bone is not yet in the socket, I'm certain that it soon will be, and that I shall be made perfectly whole. I'm giving minute details of my healing because it would be considered a medical impossibility and a miracle from a religious standpoint. However, I have watched the restoration year after year as I applied the power of thought, and I know it is under divine law. So I'm satisfied that here is proof of a law that the mind builds the body and can restore it. So needless to say, <clears throat> Here are a couple of people who had a direct connection to what they were talking about. This was not theory to them. It was not some grand idea. They did not set out to start some sort of cult. What they had found was something that saved them, physically, literally saved them and they just wanted to share it with people. So what happened was by 19, or 1889, they had both gone to Emma Curtis Hopkins, the same woman who had taught E.B. Weeks, and they were ordained. Now what I find interesting is that right up until that time, Charles had been doing very well in the real estate business and he'd continued in it. The very next year in 1890, the bottom fell out of the real estate market in Kansas City. And Charles, who would have been considered a millionaire by our standards, um, a third party claimed that up until that time he was worth about $150,000 in, $150, in 1889 money, well over a million now. By 1890, they were worth nothing. Um, I read a story of them, you know, being feeling lucky to get a, a $5 donation around Christmas so they could buy toys for the boys. But they began this business of spreading the good news, you know, which is something that our way shower taught us to do, spread the good news. And at first, it was simply a matter of Myrtle kind of going around to her neighbors and saying, hey, I'm better. Is there anything that you'd like help with? Eventually, she didn't even have to do that. People would just show up in their parlor first thing in the morning, and they would start helping them heal themselves. For about a 20-year period, in addition to everything else that they were doing, both she and Charles saw an average of about 20 people a day for mental healing. So I know that today, here in Birmingham, Alabama, where you can't hardly trip without falling into a hospital, <laughs> that might seem kind of quaint, right? Oh, well, that's just, you know, that's just hokey. They believed a lot of crazy things back then. But it's not so crazy. I mean, even today, we talk about things like the placebo effect, right? Which is nothing more than the mind healing the body. When people are given a sugar pill and they think it's going to cure them, guess what? About half the time it does because they believed it would. And as I think I've pointed out in one of my other talks, because 
in order to get a new drug approved by the FDA, it has to pass at least two blind studies and has to do better than the placebo effect. Many of the drug companies are now having some difficulties because the placebo effect is apparently getting stronger. <laughs> right? So whether you want to call it the placebo effect or you want to call it mental cure, which is what they called it back in the day, it seems irrefutable that at least many people have had success healing themselves with their faith, with their minds. Now, I will suggest to you that if you have something you're attempting to cure in this fashion, it helps to make sure that everything else you are doing is in alignment and in integrity with your vision of being cured. So if you have some sort of disease or malady, and rather than do what the folks at the many hospitals around are telling you, you say, no, that just doesn't feel right. I'm gonna fix it myself. So you start working with yourself the way that Myrtle did. And you know, talking to the cells of your body, talking to your organs, talking to your systems, letting them know that you love them immediately after a session of letting them know you love them, you don't want to suck down half a pound of M&Ms. <laughs> For example, right? Right? You know, or knock out a box of wine. Okay? Because at some level, even though, <laughs> right? I'm not making this up. At some level, part of you knows as much as I may enjoy those M&Ms or that wine, you know, it's really not good for me. And it will undo the good that you are doing in here because our subconscious knows. Our subconscious knows, right? But in addition to actually working with people and doing hands-on healing all that time, the Fillmore's began publishing. First, they were publishing just little pamphlets talking about truth principles and about mental healing. And as they began doing that, more and more people became aware of what they were doing and more and more people became interested. And what they were doing took on a life of its own. Very early on, they began doing something they called the Society of Silent Unity. And in the early days, what it amounted to was this. They would let people know, those people who were interested in joining them, that tonight we're going to be praying about whatever it was. And so at first, at uh, 10 o'clock at night, everyone who had agreed to be part of the Society of Silent Unity would stop what they were doing and they would pray about what that particular thing was. And because they were in the Midwest and many of the people who followed them were farmers, they decided, you know, 10 o'clock might be a little bit late, so we're going to do it at 9. So then they moved that to 9. One thing led to another. People began sending them prayer requests by mail. And so they established at their headquarters in Kansas City an office that took those letters, and responded to them. Eventually, they had paid workers doing that. Today, we still have Silent Unity. And Silent Unity has been on the grounds at Unity Village, essentially since it was built. But even before that, Silent Unity was in Kansas City. We recently celebrated, I think it was the 125th anniversary of silent unity. Um, there's been prayer going on by silent unity workers without ceasing 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for over 100 years. Because we believe in prayer. We know that it works. We've seen it in our own bodies. It's interesting. I mentioned last week, I think, that in the early days of unity, 
one could not become a unity teacher then in, in the 1930s a unity minister until one was able to demonstrate to actually show that at whatever level that they could heal they could bring about prosperity today I don't think any one of you when you're feeling ill thinks gee I need to go see Reverend Charles down at the church probably not a thought that crosses your mind you know most of us say I'm gonna call my doctor right or I'm just gonna go down to the drugstore and get you know whatever the thing was that worked the last time and I'm not encouraging you to show up sick all the time I just, <laughs> But I think it's important to know that this stuff, that the people who founded this denomination, and they really didn't intend to found a denomination, this stuff that worked in their lives didn't go away. You know, one of the things that always made me feel so disconnected from the stories about Jesus and about the healing that he did was that it, you know, it was so long ago you know, it's thousands of years, and it's, you know, we don't have any actual records of that stuff. We have stories people told, you know, other people that told other people that finally wrote it down several generations later. You know, we don't have any pictures or anything like that. We have pictures of the Fillmores. We have, you know, newsreels of them. We have recordings of their voices. Charles didn't die until 1948. Myrtle died in 1931. Now, this is interesting. You know, one of the keys of Charles's philosophy and his theology was this idea that we are able to regenerate our bodies through the use of our minds. And I can't say that I agree with Charles Fillmore about everything. Um, he felt that it was our ultimate destiny to be able to live forever. He felt that what had happened to Jesus was that he had such control over his body that even after he died, he was able to get his organs and his body to regenerate themselves so that by three days later, he was able to emerge. And then with such control over his body that when it was time for him to ascend, he could essentially discorporate his body into the energy that it was made from. I would say maybe as possible but not likely. And I think if Charles had been exposed to the Bible scholarship that we have unearthed in the decades since he passed, as well as if he had been exposed to the science that we have come to since he had been passed, um, he might have a different view. It's interesting, we, one of the most famous stories about him is standing in a class, teaching it, and, you know, when asking for questions, have one of his students say, hey, but, you know, you said in, in this book right here, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he's recorded to famously said, well, you know, I reserve the right to change my mind. And even when he kind of laid out his credo, um, his statement of faith is what he called it. But, you know, in, in ministry, we call it our credo. And it was 32 points that he'd written out. When it was published, he even wrote at the bottom of that and I may change my mind. You know, if I get some new information, he said, but, th but this is the basics. But I think the thing that he and Myrtle both had that is not really subject to debate is they had a deep understanding of the power that we have as divine human beings to affect our own lives in a very personal way. And they were willing to devote themselves to living that way and to help other people know about what living that way looked like. When they decided to devote themselves full time to this work, um, in 1892, they signed a covenant. It's called their Dedication and Covenant, and they signed it together on December 7th of 1892. 
And it says, we, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, husband and wife, hereby dedicate ourselves, our time, our money, all we have and all we expect to have to the spirit of truth and through it to the society of silent unity. It being understood and agreed that the said spirit of truth shall render unto us an equivalent for this dedication in peace of mind, health of body, wisdom, understanding, love, life, and abundant supply of all things necessary to meet every want without any of these things the object of our existence in the presence of the conscious mind of Christ Jesus the seventh day of December, 1892. What they were saying was a really powerful lesson to all of us today whether you decide to say on that side of the fourth wall or you ever end up here like I somehow did is that if we are willing to dedicate our lives to truth everything we have all of our love all of our attention all of our treasures that they will be returned to us and more without the treasures themselves being the objects of what we're all about. That spirit of giving being key to our prosperity, whether it is the giving of love to our own bodies so that we may receive health in return, the giving of our talents to all those places where the universe needs them, the giving of our time back to Spirit, God, the universe, so that we may be better equipped, so that our spirits may fly a little bit higher. rather than running and chasing after the material prosperity that they knew all too well could just disappear in a moment, like Charles's wealth did. They dedicated themselves. And what happened was nothing short of miraculous. The magazine that they began publishing after a short time became the most widely circulated magazine published in the Midwest. They purchased one of the first radio stations and became literally the first religious broadcaster. Uh, we today still have denominate, or, or, um, congregations in Africa that began because Charles Fillmore was bouncing his signal at a much higher power than the FCC thought he was using off the atmosphere and they were receiving his signals a continent away. <coughs> Unity Village was built during the Great Depression, largely, and from the two of them essentially being the entire thing where they would write the articles, work the typeset on the one you know, printing press that they had that nearly got taken away back when they were first getting started and didn't have a lot of money. One last anecdote about Myrtle, and I'll let it go at that. When they first got started, they were basically just making ends meet. You know, money came in, the money went right back out, and, but they stayed with it. And one day some fellows came to grab their printing press because they hadn't been able to make the payments on it. And Myrtle told them that they would get their money because she had a rich father. And she, she, would, in, she would inherit a great deal not to worry. I think they could tell that she meant what she said. 
even though her idea of a rich father and their idea of a rich father was very, very different. The truth is, is we all have Myrtle Fillmore's rich father. When we know that, when we truly believe it, we can heal our bodies. We can heal our hearts. We can live lives of abundance if we have the faith of Myrtle and the perseverance of Charles. Please join me in prayer. Sweet Spirit, today we say thank you. We say thank you for that couple, those two people who staked everything they had on their faith in you, on their knowledge that you are with us, in us, and you live and breathe as us every day, every moment, every breath for their vision, for their faith, for their perseverance, and for their abiding love, we are forever grateful. Thank you. Thank you, sweet spirit. So it is.